this week on Vaticano. Pope Francis meets with the President of Palestine and reaffirms his support for the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A photographic exhibition in St. Peter's Square showcases the beauty of creation and sends a message to world leaders gathered at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Participate with us in the Roman Knights event and learn about virtue in the workplace. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Founded at the end of the 16th century, the Vatican Library contains more than 180,000 manuscripts. 1.6 million printed books, and 300,000 coins and medals. It is undoubtedly one of the most important libraries in the world. At the end of the 19th century, the library opened up to a wider public of researchers and historians. Today, this desire to dialogue with the contemporary world continues and was concretely realized in November with the opening of a new exhibition space dedicated to hosting contemporary art exhibitions. Vatican Bureau Chief Andrea Stonehauser brings us inside. We're here in the Sala Barberini and uh, with me is Pietro Ruffo, who designed the backsides of many, many thousands of books here with a very special motive. Uh, Mr. Rufo, maybe you can explain a little bit what we see here in the background. Yes, he here we are in the Sala Barberini and I have decided to do this site-specific installation, creating a forest. A forest drawn on thousands of rolled, rolled paper. Archivist and librarian, Cardinal Jose Tolentino de Mendoza, explained that the exhibition space is inspired by Pope Francis' call, not only to preserve the past, but it's also a place to move towards the future. And this exhibition hall is a manifestation of a desire to dialogue, to bring together the contemporary perspectives of artists, curators, philosophers, and scholars with the patrimony of the Vatican Library, bringing it to the present and the new readings, showing the possibilities by helping to translate this heritage in a new language both a scientific language and an artistic language, like this one that Pietro Ruffo has built in this exhibition. From November of 2021 to February of 2022, the new space is hosting an exhibit called Tutti, Humanity on its Way, inspired by Pope Francis' encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. It shows works by the contemporary artist Pietro Rufo, who reinterpreted historic treasures from the library, like a nearly 20-foot-long map of the Nile, which was created by Ottoman explorer Evliya Celebi in the 17th century. We are here in the Kokorian Exhibition Hall in the Vatican Library. Um, it's a new exhibition space uh, that the library has to offer. And with me here, Vice Prefect, um, why was this space opened with an exhibition of Mr. Rufo? Was there a special reason to, to, to open it with uh, his works of art? It seemed very fitting to have particularly Mr. Rufo uh, inaugurate this dialogue uh, between our collections and modern art with his particular vision, which seemed to us to go very well with the Holy Father's uh, teachings and particularly the encyclical Laudato Si. The first visitor to the exhibition was Pope Francis, who inaugurated the space and said that the church must bear witness to the importance of beauty and culture. 
dialoguing with unique thirst for the infinite that defines the human being. Since 1941, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has divided the region, pitting neighbor against neighbor. The conflict was born from the division of Palestine into Arab and Jewish states. Throughout the years, attempts have been made to reconcile the tension in the Middle East through peace treaties and international intervention, but none has proved to be lasting. On November the 4th, in a private audience with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, Pope Francis affirmed the desire for a two-state solution to the conflict. According to Catholic News Agency, the Holy See has long supported the idea of two separate states and in 2015 made this official with an agreement recognizing the state of Palestine. President Abbas and Pope Francis also agreed that Jerusalem must not continue to be a place of conflict and violence, but of encounter. The holy city must also be seen as having universal value to the three religions stemming from Abraham, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The two heads of state spoke about the urgency of promoting human fraternity, peaceful coexistence among faiths, and avoiding the use of weapons. This desire for peace has been an important part of Pope Francis' papacy. In the second year of his papacy, while on a trip to Palestine, the Holy Father invited the leaders of both Israel and Palestine to the Vatican to renew their peace talks. For the fifth World Day of the Poor, Pope Francis is meeting 500 poor people from all across Europe in Assisi. The theme of the 2021 World Day of the Poor is taken from Mark 14.7. The poor you will always have with you. In his message, Pope Francis highlighted that poverty is not a consequence of fate. Rather, it concretely points to Christ's presence among us. As I never tire of repeating, the poor are true evangelizers, for they were the first to be evangelized and called to share in the Lord's joy and his kingdom. Pope Francis established this day in 2016 to encourage more people worldwide to listen and respond to the cry of the poor. The Vatican has officially announced Pope Francis' next papal visit to Cyprus and Greece from December the 2nd through the 6th. The trip's theme is comforting each other in faith, which the Vatican says is inspired by the Apostle Barnabas, whose name means Son of Consolation. The logo features a ship with the cross of Christ as the mast, sailing on the rough waters of our world, with the sails filled with the wind of the Holy Spirit. The four-day trip includes stops in the capital of Cyprus, Nicosia, the capital of Greece, Athens, and the Greek island of Lesbos. While in Cyprus, the Holy Father will meet with the local Catholic community, Orthodox Archbishop Chrysostomus II, and a group of migrants and refugees. The pandemic led the Holy Father to cancel or postpone many international visits. However, the Holy Father promised the Bishops' Conference of Canada that he will visit the country sometime next year. There's another country that awaits the visit of the Holy Father, Kazakhstan. On November the 6th, the President of the Kazakh Senate, Maulin Ashimbayev, arrived to the Vatican to officially invite the Holy Father. Today, he handed the Pope a personal invitation on behalf of the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jomar Takayev, 
to join the 7th Congress of Leaders of the World and Traditional Religions, which will be held next year on September 14th and 15th in the capital of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan. The ambassador of Kazakhstan says that such a visit will be a contribution to dialogue and peace in the whole Central Asian region. The Congress of the Leaders of World and Traditional Religions might become a platform for the second meeting of Pope Francis with Russian Orthodox Patriarch Cyril, because he is also on the list of invitees. Cardinal Leonardo Sandri, prefect for the Congregation for the Oriental Churches, paid a nine-day-long visit to Syria, showcasing Pope Francis' support and solidarity for the suffering Catholic communities there. The trip included stops in Damascus, Tardis, Homs, Aleppo, Yabrud, and Malula. Cardinal Sandri met with Christian authorities, celebrated masses for the faithful, attended interreligious meetings, and visited local cathedrals and basilicas. The Holy Father appointed Franciscan sister Raffaella Petrini, the Secretary General of the Vatican City Governaturato, the second highest ranking position in the government of the city-state. Sister Petrini is the first woman and non-clergy member to hold this post. Sister Petrini's appointment makes her one of the highest ranking women in the Vatican. A member of the Franciscan Sisters of the Eucharist, she's been working in the Vatican since 2005 as an official of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Welcome to Vatican number three. This is how St. Pope John Paul II referred to Gemelli Hospital, having recovered here 11 times. The relationship between the hospital and the popes is very tight. Every pope since St. John XXIII has visited the hospital, and this summer, Pope Francis received an operation and recovered here. This year marks the 60th anniversary since the foundation of the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. Today, students of the faculty are excited to welcome their most highly anticipated guest, Pope Francis. The Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in Gemelli Hospital is named for the Sacred Heart of Jesus, emphasizing that in Jesus there is healing and comfort. We are super excited to see him so close. The Gemelli Hospital is very important for the Catholic world. I mean, uh, it, it's a great emotion to, to have the Pope here because uh, I, I think he has a lot, like a sort of uh, affiliation with this hospital. As a Catholic, it's uh, you know very important to study in uh, a new university that is so close to um, to our roots of the Catholic world. So. The heart of Jesus beats for us, always repeating those words. 
Courage. Courage. Do not be afraid. I am here. In his homily, Pope Francis said that love speaks for itself. It does not speak of itself. And he invited the faithful to imitate God's love, to become passionate about the man who suffers. He said, uh, uh, help us to feel dear any person that is coming close to us because it's in need. And that's actually the first thing that I learned when I came here as a student uh, 35 years ago. Pietro Chiurazzi teaches genetics in the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. The peculiarity of the University of the Sacred Heart is that both lay and religious professors are working hand in hand to educate students and offer them both scientific and theological formation. Theology is the opportunity to enlarge the reason, the opportunity to enlarge our uh, idea of the world and, on, and of the life. The University of the Sacred Heart was inaugurated by St. Pope John XXIII with the words that it will grow and flourish. Pope Francis celebrated Mass here on November the 5th, the same day on which St. Pope John XXIII inaugurated the faculty 60 years ago. God help us to bear it in the proper way. Catholic, Universidad Católica. Catholic is not just an adjective. It should be our sense and mission as every doctor, but even more so because we bear this name. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development launched this photo exhibition on the brink of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26. The photographic exhibition, entitled Emotions to Generate Change, displays 26 photographs and is dedicated to Pope Francis' encyclical letter, Laudato Si. Creator of the exhibition, Lia Beltrami, says that the idea of the exhibition is to show the complex but beautiful relationship between man and nature. One of the two strongest shots is this boy. He is a boy who lives in a garbage dump. The crows come to the dump and he finds his beauty in imitating the crows flying. This doesn't mean we have to justify the poverty of this boy. In fact, we have to do everything to help him come out of it. However, he teaches us to grasp beauty and to know how to look at beauty. The other shot, which is very strong, is this one, the girl selling dry fish, the relationship between man and nature. These two eyes that have such a deep spirituality that they tell us in the strongest, most intense way of Laudato Si. These photographs are taken by Asaf Ud Daula, a young photographer from Bangladesh. Asaf already collaborated with the Vatican for a previous expo, and with the money he received, was able to buy a new photo camera to capture the beauty and reality of his country. Beltrami explains that each image has a quote from Pope Francis' encyclical letter, highlighting the unique relationship between nature, man, 
in God. Creation is a caress of God. The gaze of people you meet is a caress of God. And living life, being able to read this caress of God truly changes you inside and truly becomes a life of Laudato Si. The exhibition is on display under the left colonnade of St. Peter's Square and will remain until Christmas when it will start its journey around the world. EWTN Vatican Bureau launched its first event series called Roman Nights. Ladies and gentlemen, a panel discussion on topics concerning life and religion, featuring people of faith living in Rome. On November the 4th, ambassadors, businessmen, professors, politicians, religious and clergy came together to discuss virtue in the workplace and the Order of the Holy Sepulchre opened its palace doors to host the event. Roman Knights is part of a special calling. We see ourselves like the Order as well in supporting the Church and supporting the Holy Father and bringing the good news to all the ends of the world. Come from the business world. And how does virtue play a role in fulfilling that calling? Is there room for virtue in the modern workplace? How do we apply virtue to our family and business lives? These were some of the questions that Ambassador Edward Habsburg, Daniele Di Fausto, and Father John Walk discussed. Your work uh, will always have a touch of family. Um, for me, this is very practically so right now because I live in a small embassy. Um, my family lives on the first floor and the embassy is on the ground floor. So this means that from time to time my children will come down uh, when I have a very important meeting in, um, in my living room downstairs, you will hear uh, steps upstairs. It will always remind you that you're a family man. It will always remind you that jobs come and go. Uh, family remains. Maybe you can share with us a little For bit. For entrepreneur Daniele Di Fausto, family values can also be found in the business world. I think that uh, it's a moment where it's so important to be authentic. And so we, I think that in companies, especially CEO in many big corporations, sometimes have the idea to change their workplace, copying some, some concept from other companies. And after sometimes they realize that it's not working. And always talking with them and say, it's, the company is like a life, it's like a family. So you have your own identity, and it's very important that this organization can, uh, can be built, designed, and then lived with the, uh, with the concept that identity brings value. And if this concept is embraced, then other things will follow. Father John, let me also ask you, as a priest, but also as a professor, as a media expert, do you think that virtues are still necessary or are they necessary also for you in doing many things at the same time? Virtue is enormously relevant in the workplace, but I think even before, before talking about specific virtues that one can live while doing one's work, it's important to understand work itself as something good, as a service, as a way of giving glory to God, and as a way of serving others. Virtue is heroic, and it's not heroic on, in special circumstances. The heroicness of virtue is on display every single day in one's family life, in one's daily work. We have the opportunity, in fact, not just the opportunity, I'd say, to be heroic. Uh, we actually need to be heroic. Uh, and even, even to live up to the basic duties often requires a kind of heroism, a kind of dying to oneself saying, you know, this, this is not easy. I need the grace of God to do this. Uh, and I'm going to do it because I know this is the right thing to do. It's fortitude again, right? And that's heroic. And to do that consistently is truly heroic. I mean, everyone can do it once in a while, perhaps. 
but to do that day in and day out as many mothers and fathers of families are called to do with children, imagine children with special needs and all these things, is that's, that's heroism and that, that's strength. The conversation continued with light refreshments and an opportunity to admire the historic palace of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, which works to support Christians in the Holy Land and to promote peace. The live stream reached 42,000 people worldwide and can be found on EWTN Vatican's social media pages. Mark your calendars for the next Roman Nights live event in January 2022.